Hello, and thank you for listening to this webinar. I'm Rahul Bardwaj, the President and CEO of the Institute of Corporate Directors. As Canada and the world grapple with the implications of the COVID-19 pandemic, the ICD is producing a series of webinars that will focus on critical areas of governance that will help directors navigate the challenges in the weeks and months ahead. As shops close, non-essential services cease operation and markets cease, the economic fallout of this crisis is hitting virtually every Canadian organization. Today, we will examine how board of directors should be leading through this financial distress. Joining me today to discuss how directors should understand the distress their organizations are going through are Alan Hibben and Mark Wasserman. Alan is the principal of Shaker Hill Partners, a consulting firm that provides strategic and financial advice. He is a director and chair of the Audit Committee at Wild Brain Limited, a director and chair of the Audit Committee at Extendicare Inc., a director of Home Capital Group Inc., and as a director of the Mount Sinai Hospital Foundation. Mark Wasserman is the national chair insolvency and restructuring at Osler, Hoskin, and Harcourt. He's been involved in many complex corporate recapitalizations, reorganizations, and restructurings, and has expertise in national, cross-border, and international <clears throat> matters, acting for major debtor corporations, bondholders, senior lenders, and acquirers. He also regularly provides strategic advice and risk analysis on structuring of corporate and lending transactions, Welcome to you both. Now we're going to discuss the micro in a minute and talk about what steps directors can be taking today, but I want to start with the macro issues. And Alan, let me start with you. What can the role of a board be in a time of crisis like this? Is there a broader public policy dialogue that directors should be plugging into, or is that simply a luxury at this time? Uh, th thanks, Rule, and uh, and thank you for having me uh, back again. We did this uh, this uh, seminar, I think, uh, four or five months ago, <laughs> which which now seems about five years ago in terms of the the steps that the directors can take in financial distress. So this is obviously a completely different world than than what we were talking about in the fall. Um, in in terms of of the the board of directors. I think the first thing I would say is we're not going to talk about it today, but all of my boards, the boards are very actively involved both inside and outside their own organizations with respect to the to the health issues around the crisis. And I, I'm not going to talk about that today, but that's clearly something that the boards of directors are spending an enormous amount of time on. I would say with respect to directors, uh, the first job of a director, of course, is to is to make sure that his his company survives. And uh, in, in that respect, I would say there are kind of two kinds of directors that are out there. Uh, there are directors involved in large, stable uh, companies that will likely survive and and may even thrive in this in this uh, in this state uh, that that really do have. Some, some broader obligations with respect to uh, the macro policy environment. And then there's some of us who are trying to do minute by minute and day by day triage on our companies to ensure that they actually survive and, and, and we're deeply involved in the, in the liquidity aspects, which we will talk about in, in a few minutes. What I would say for, for those people who are um, who are directors of, of substantial and, and surviving entities, it's very important to have a dialogue with governments in, in, a, in a broad sense. So let me give you two examples. In the, uh, in, in the small bank that I'm a, a director of, we have constant uh, conversations with CDIC, with OSFI, with the Bank of Canada, with CMHC, with the Minister of Finance, and that is all helpful, not just to uh, promote a particular policy objective, but what we do find is that those government agencies uh, and, and the, even on the ministry side don't have a great view of what actually happens in a disaster like this. So 
quite important for us to be spending some time uh, on that. The, the second example I'd give you is uh, I'm on the board of Extendicare, which is long-term care, retirement, and home health care. And there we're, we're in regular dialogue with the Ministry of Long-Term Care, the Ministry of Health, because it's important to get the policy objectives correct there in, in order to provide the money that is required to step up in the uh, in these circumstances and make sure that uh, that the populations can can be served. So I, I think there is there is a macro uh, a macro uh, role for for directors, even even in the case of of directors in companies that are a, against the wall. I think the question of leadership is not just with the management teams, but uh, employees, customers, uh, suppliers need to be convinced that the board of directors is in charge, that there is a plan, that people are focusing on the things that need to be focused on. In, in, a, in a disaster like COVID-19, it's very easy to get emotionally uh, upset. Everyone is emotionally upset. And I think that corporations, uh, as well as governments and others, are looking to directors to be a calming force, not necessarily that they would know exactly what to do, because of course we don't, uh, but that we would, uh, we would be a calming force uh, to uh, organizations and, and to the public at large. That's a great uh, setup for our conversation today, Alan. And I want to go to Mark, though, to get your perspective on this as well. We'll dig into the issues around suppliers and around uh, directors uh, and deeper. But uh, on, this, on this particular issue, Mark, what are your thoughts? Yeah, thank you very much. And I echo uh, Alan's comments. Uh, thanks for, for having me. Um, I certainly found uh, the seminars we did uh, towards the end of uh, last year uh, uh, fun and informative. And the questions uh, that were raised by audience members, I thought, were um, insightful uh, and sparked a lot of conversation. So I appreciate you guys um, continuing to put on seminars like this, which I think are helpful for uh, board members uh, to listen to in all different sizes uh, of organizations. I mean, I I echo um, what Alan is saying in the context of, you know, from a director's perspective, you know, you have to look at the situation that's facing your organization. And we all know that directors have a duty to act in the best interest of the corporation. And what that means in this context, you know, I think is evolving. Um, and that's because I think the context and the situation, as Alan says, evolves daily. Uh, every day, um, you know, there's more restrictions. Uh, every day, there's more markets that are becoming uh, restricted worldwide. Uh, lots of Canadian companies have operations in, you know, foreign markets uh, require uh, supply or other things from foreign markets, which can make, you know, the situation in Canada and dealing with their own organization much more difficult. But in the context of a, pub, a broader public policy dialogue, I mean, I do think that that's important. I think that companies, to the extent that they can, should be speaking with, you know, be it various financial institutions at either the municipal, provincial, or federal level, uh, and they should be taking steps to the extent that they can to sort of ease the burden on, uh, you know, Canadians and the economy as a whole if possible. And you can see things like organizations that are going to benefit from this, you know, ramping up hiring. Um, so, for example, you know, Sobeys just announced uh, that it's going to hire some of the laid off retail workers. You know, we see, you know, comments like uh, uh, Galen Weston making in the law boss scenario about maintaining safety um, for not only the consumers, but also the employees. Uh, and those are things I think from a director perspective, you know, are important to the extent that you can make that happen for your organization to do. And this is obviously not a scenario uh, in which uh, it's only affecting one organization. There's all, many organizations that are affected by it and it has a significant effect on many 
Canadians um, who, uh, you know, may not have uh, the luxury to work from home, may have already been laid off, um, may not have significant savings to weather uh, a couple of months uh, of social distancing. Uh, and I think it's important that boards recognize that and not not do something that doesn't allow them to discharge their fiduciary duties, but in the context of discharging those fiduciary duties, you know, think about ways in which they can help uh, the public uh, and the broader policy uh, that the governments are coming out with be implemented to uh, ease some of the burden that's going to be felt by many, many people as a result of this crisis. Right. Those are some great comments. So let's get into the micro now, a little bit more on the nitty gritty and assume most uh, companies are in a similar position of vulnerability, but when you really get down to it, what type of conversation should companies and boards be having with their suppliers customers, lenders, even government funders. Are these conversations around finding ways to share the pain or they should be thinking about other things as well? And Alan, maybe I'll go to you first on this. Okay. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll quote myself from, from last fall. If you don't have liquidity, you've got nothing. So I, I think that the conversations that we're first having all relate to um, what does our liquidity situation look like and how do these other entities, lenders, suppliers, customers, and governments uh, affect our ability uh, to generate the liquidity that we're going to need? Um, I'm, I'm very impressed that the, the, the markets have really seized up dramatically. Um, I don't know if you've seen investment grade spreads on bonds, but investment grade spreads on bonds have, have uh, widened out dramatically, and, and certainly with things that are less than investment grade, they've widened out way more than that. And, and there is a, a significant rush to liquidity that the Fed has understood and the Bank of Canada is coming around to understand. So, so first of all, it's, it's the question of, of liquidity, and, and that really brings you, first of all, to your lenders. Um, I, think, I think there are a number of organizations over the last, uh, over the last 10 years that have migrated their, uh, their lending relationships away from the chartered banks. And this has been done uh, because the banks have had uh, capital issues that they wanted to address. And, and, and so the conversations with lenders, I think, are becoming somewhat more difficult these days uh, than they might have been 10 years ago. Uh, for example, in a number of the companies I'm involved in, we have a revolving bank likely a committed revolver um, up, up until a couple of days ago that revolver would not have been drawn it's, it's now drawn uh, because we want to make sure that we have the cash in the bank but then you look to the rest of the uh, the debt capital structure of your organization and a fair chunk of that is held by uh, specialized lending funds hedge funds etc and and one of the things that we're seeing now is because the hedge funds are in such disarray, again, looking to liquidity for their own unit holders, some of those positions are being sold from hedge funds to other hedge funds. And so the conversation that you need to have with your lenders is much more complicated. And, and in the case of the term B market, it may be impossible uh, up until the point that you actually absolutely have to deal with a covenant violation or something else. So so the first conversation is with the lenders, um, and then and then we're sort of going down the uh, the balance sheet and trying to match up <clears throat> where do our our customer receivables stand with uh, with the, the ability that we have to pay payables. And to give you an example. One of my companies last week we received zero uh, in in payments on accounts receivable, and I don't think it was because people weren't capable of paying. They were all trying to figure out how do we have uh, an organization working from home that can still satisfy uh, the requirements of that. So I think it's, it's very important to be looking at that. In terms of your suppliers, I think the biggest issue will be uh, where your supply chain is complex and, and has geographic diversity. Uh, I think in that situation, we've all known that the Chinese supply chain has been entirely disrupted, 
I think you'd have to be talking to your suppliers about what is their fallback position uh, in order to continue to generate product if, if they can. Uh, our, our belief is that, that additional countries such as the Philippines and Mexico uh, may have very substantial issues uh, coming up in the near future and therefore it's important to have enough of a discussion with your suppliers to figure out what you might be able to do in terms of supply chain. And then, and then for those companies that are after they've done all their scenario modeling and liquidity planning, et cetera, et cetera, and, and it becomes quite obvious that they're, they're in an industry where, where cash flow is simply drying up or already has dried up like retail, then, then we, or restaurants, we then have to think about are there additional sources of liquidity that might be out there? There are programs at the moment from EDC, BDC, Bank of Canada, and, and CMHC, and, but those are, are very new, uh, very difficult to understand how they're going to be exercised. Uh, and there's, uh, there's some pressure, I think, on the government to make sure that the small businesses are, are satisfied in this through BDC. Um, a number of companies I know are, are talking to EDC about, about backstops and, and then, and then clearly in the case of, uh, of financial intermediaries, uh, the discussions with, with Minister of Finance and the Bank of Canada. So I, I think there's, uh, there's a lot of conversations going on. I would say everyone is running around pretty fast here, but no one actually knows how this is going to come out. So the liquidity requirements, which will escalate dramatically over the course of the next couple of weeks, uh, the systems and programs may not be able to keep up with it. The, right. the other point I would make is that there's a fair bit of disinformation out there, and, and even where people are, are, are those of goodwill, we don't actually know what to plan for. So uh, I came off a board meeting earlier today where it was either eight weeks or 18 months, and, uh, and it's very difficult to plan your liquidity horizon if you have no idea how long the clamps are going to be on the economy. Uh, and, and my own personal view is that there will be very substantial dislocation uh, that is not capable of being solved by governments or banks uh, if this goes on beyond another eight weeks or so. Right. Mark, I'd love you to pick up on, on this as well, but also... Uh, your thoughts on this question, but also what type of information is important for the board to have in order to assess the organization's risk of financial distress and maybe even some comments about the type of reporting the board should be, be expecting from management here? Sure. Um, just uh, on a, a couple of points on, um, you know, conversations with stakeholders. Um, for sure. You know, so uh, I agree uh, and uh, with everything that uh, Alan's describing, and I think that you know it's a fun it, it's difficult to have sort of a one size fits all analysis on this because, as Alan noted, you know retail uh restaurants, anything that's sort of consumer heavy in the sense of actual physical traffic um is effectively shut down right so live performances. Um, you know, theaters and that and the like, I mean, their revenue is basically at zero. Their revenue is zero. There's no more revenue. Um, so those industries are looking at a scenario where either, you know, they're going to get a, some kind of, if they have a debt, be it a revolving debt or term loan B debt, uh, they're going to need, you know, some kind of debt relief um, from their lenders or, you know, their lenders in a term loan B market are going to push them into a scenario where there's going to be a debt for equity swap. And without some kind of, you know, cultural importance to Canada, um, it may be difficult to save uh, or it may be difficult to get the government to come step forward and provide some, you know, backstop uh, from EDC or otherwise in those organizations. Um, when you're dealing with large chains, large retail chains, I mean, retail, as we all know, was sort of teetering on the edge, right? And uh, there was a lot of retailers that were suffering, um, you know, significant uh, financial pain as a result of changing 
changes in consumer habits, you know, that's obviously accelerated exponentially now. And the difficulty is a lot of those retailers will have ABL or revolving loans, and there's no ability to go and liquidate inventory because to liquidate inventory, you actually need the foot traffic. So that creates a challenge not only for the retailers, but for the supply chain into those retailers, there's going to be a glut of inventory that's going to have to be dealt with once the social distancing measures are eased. And there's going to be a significant number of banks that have capital tied up um, in these retailers that are going to be looking for ways to get that out. So I think that is going to take, once the social distancing is eased, you know, months, if not years, uh, to, to work through. And I think there's going to be significant supply chain disruptions because of the volumes of inventory that are going to be built up. So those, that suggests to you that boards in that scenario have to start thinking about, you know, ways in which if this is a two month or a three month or a six week or longer, what they should be doing now, right, to recognize they're going to have a very, very different footprint when this opens. And even when the social easing ends, you know, my expectation is consumer habits and people's interaction with one another are going to change. So it's not going to get back to what it was. Uh, before the social distancing measures came, it's going to be sort of an easing into that, not not because of easing and social distancing. I just think people are going to be, you know, more uh, less inclined uh, to be around other people for a while until this until they know that you know risks associated with COVID from a COVID from a health perspective are gone. In terms of looking at um, what boards should ask um, or expect from management teams for uh managing through this i i mean management teams should be putting together situation analysis that i'm described that build out you know a 13 week cash flow that create you know assumptions on revenue assumptions on supply uh, assumptions on um uh, uh opex that show uh, you know, how this is going to shake out over whatever period they think. And they can build out an eight-week, they can build out a cash flow that's got an eight-week sensitivity analysis, a 12-week sensitivity analysis, just recognizing and showing the boards, you know, where the liquidity pitfalls may be. And again, it's guesswork, of course. I mean, all cash flows are guesswork. But this one even though, because, as I said, you have no idea what consumer behavior is going to be like, and we don't know how long this is going to be, and we don't know what the impact is going to be on other countries uh, in the world uh, that we may be doing business with. So it creates uh, a very difficult planning exercise for boards, um, uh, I mean, for management, but it's something that, you know, I think management teams that most of the companies we're involved with are doing, uh, and I think it's something that boards, uh, it that boards should be expecting from their management teams. And if they're not getting it, they should be asking uh, for it. I also think that, you know, management ought to be reporting to boards, you know, more frequently than you may do when you're not in a crisis situation. I mean, this is, you know, this is obviously an evolving and new situation for everybody to be engaged in. Um, and, you know, things around uh, reporting around, uh, employee issues, you know, to the extent that there are issues with their suppliers, you may find that suppliers, you know, that supply a specific product to you are no longer going to be able to do so because they're going to have their own issues. So are you going to need to find some kind of resourcing opportunities, things that are going to potentially impair the business once social distancing um, is lifted uh, that, um, you know, management should be thinking about uh, when you come out of this. And then obviously the most important, well, one of the most important things that boards are going to want to be thinking about is, you know, what um, what personal liability perspective, what personal liability issues um, do they have uh, that the company needs to address? So to the extent that, you know, cash is dried up, is there still money to pay for accrued and unpaid wages and vacation pay, which could pose personal liability for the board? Um, you know, what's the situation with collected and unremitted sales tax uh, and things of of that nature 
that could present personal liability for the board, ensuring that those things are paid uh, and that the corporation uh, is working, uh, uh, so the management is working with the board to discharge those obligations. Right. Now, this is interesting. We've had a good conversation around the issue of liquidity. Alan, I want to come to you um, on this issue, but from a slightly different perspective. The context we've been discussing so far has been in the commercial space. We've talked about uh, debt for equity swaps. Can I ask you to put your foundation hat on for a moment? And what would you be advising uh, boards of not-for-profits right now in the context of liquidity and working with their management? Is it, is it fundamentally the same as the commercial context, or are there significant differences in your mind? Well, well, obviously, we, we uh, as a foundation, don't have a debt uh, issue, although what we do have is expectations from our, in, in the case of Mount Sinai, for example, there is an expectation of funding to the hospitals. And, and I would tell you that the hospital is under extraordinary stress at the moment. Um, it was under extraordinary stress before all of this, and you, you guys would, would already know that the uh, the occupancy rate on 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 beds is is close to 100, and in a number of cases substantially through 100 percent. So we we still have an obligation as a foundation to be supporting the hospital during this time. And and uh, I, I can say in the case of Mount Sinai, we haven't done an unusual fundraising, but another hospital that I'm involved with has uh, because they are pressing relatively hard on, on that uh, for masks, ventilators. How do, how do we get the funding that doesn't appear to be coming directly and immediately from, from the government? So I, I think, I think as, a, as a board member there, your, your responsibility is, uh, is to look a little bit to what are the immediate things that you can be doing, that your foundation can be doing to, to make the situation better. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure that we have exactly the kind of stress uh, as, a, as a foundation director that people will have in, in a commercial sense. Sure. And I'm guessing that the not-for-profits are not endowment-based are going to have a slightly different context as well. Well, obviously, looking forward here, um, our, our, our base of, of, uh, of donors, unfortunately, in, in a number of the charities that I've been involved with, our base is not broad. Uh, it's a, a number of very rich people who are less rich today, uh, particularly in, in some areas. But uh, yes, it will likely change uh, an approach uh, forward in terms of broadening out the, uh, the, uh, the foundation donor base. For sure. So let me build a little bit about, uh, on the earlier conversation where we all acknowledge that boards uh, need to make decisions based on the best available information they have. Clearly, this is a fluid situation, to say the least. You know, Alan, and then I'll come to Mark. What are your thoughts on how boards can make good and agile decisions in this environment? Well, let, let me uh, start with, and I think it really comes back to some of the things that Mark was talking about. Uh, it, it's very important to have um, a good fact base. And we all know that... Uh, there is no great way of, of forecasting what's going to happen. But I, I think it's, it's extremely in, important to get into a position where at least we have the best possible information around, uh, around the fact base. And, and similar to the discussion that we had in the fall, sometimes it's important to get some external help with respect to understanding and modeling what, what you might have. You, you hope that your organization is resilient enough and, and competent enough to do that. But in addition to that, you sometimes may need an, an objective view. So I think, I think that's important. And then, and then secondarily, the similar conversation to we, what we had in the fall, uh, it's, it's reasonably likely that you're going to get uh, into some kind of a restructuring discussion. It may not be a really complex restructuring. It may be uh, it may be relatively modest because the banks are being told to be to be flexible here. So it's important to understand as a as a board, do I have the resources that are going to allow me to good, to make good decisions in the context of restructuring and and stress? 
I, I made the point last fall of saying you should always have somebody on your board uh, that has CCAA experience. I think it's, it's coming back in spades right now that if you don't have somebody on your board with CCAA experience, you should get somebody and, and put that person within the context of your, of your decision making. The, the last point I would make is I'm not a big fan of special committees uh, for situations like this, but by almost by definition, some of our boards have sort of split into people that, that are really focused day to day to help the CEO and senior management and, and others not. Um, whereas uh, we may we may be accelerating our board meetings to weekly, uh, from quarterly, uh, but but on a day to day basis, uh, we're having conversations aside from the board, uh, as simply as advisors, uh, to try to uh, help management get in front of this. Right, Mark. What are your thoughts about good and agile decision making in this climate? Yeah. So I mean, I I I think that. This is, I mean, this is what this is like what we would say in any in any sort of restructuring um, situation. You know, when we get into a restructuring situation where you're either dealing with a liquidity issue or an operation issue or an industry issue uh, that requires um, the board to and the company to take steps to ensure that they can save as much value. Uh, for the corporation as possible. I agree with Alan. We, you know, we increase the frequency of uh, board meetings. We increase the frequency that certain members of the board have uh, with management. And, you know, these situations, um, you know, as you said in the question, are completely fluid. It's going to change. And it's going to change, you know, daily. Uh, and there's a path that you've uh, identified uh, there's a path that you think you want to go down and something's going to throw you off that path. For example, you know, one of your big customers, um, you know, ultimately files for protection or is no longer in business. Um, and now your, your go forward strategy has to change uh, because you no longer can rely on that customer. Like right? that's going to potentially change your revenue projections which was going to maybe require you to change your uh, expense re projections, your OPEX. It's going to, you know, require you to change the size of your organization. And so you have to be able to, you know, understand information, as Alan said, make sure you're up to date on the information as much as you can be. And we recognize, you know, a lot of these board members may have more than one board that they're dealing with and they're going to have other situations and, Many of us are going to have personal matters that we're going to be dealing with, you know, as part of this as well. So this is going to be a stressful time for, I think, everybody um, in managing different expectations and different uh, um, uh, pulls on your time. But you have to be agile. You have to be able to change direction. Get, I mean, if, you, if you're able to sort of see it coming in advance and plan for it even better, um, you know, but restructuring is a lot like playing chess. Uh, and, you know, you're playing chess now with the entire world. So um, it's, a, it's a very, very important feature for the board to recognize uh, that this situation is going to change and evolve. It's going to have different consequences uh, for the organization that you're in. Uh, and you have to be willing uh, to uh, move direction and change direction to address what comes at you. That's great. Well, I must say the chess imagery is a great way to, to end off a very rich conversation today. Uh, thank you both. But before we do sign off, are there any final thoughts you'd like to share? And perhaps, Mark, I'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I think it's, it's more of a sum summary of what I think we've both been saying here. Uh, you know, the situation is unfortunate. Um, you know, we see governments now, at least one government, the U.S., uh, you know, sort of thinking and hinting that, you know, the economic damage is going to be significant if, uh, I think Trump put it, you know, we don't reopen for business. Uh, and I think governments around the world are uh, sort of seeing that as well. Um, I think, you know, this requires, as Alan said, a very sort of steady hand. Um, it requires, 
uh, patience. Uh, it requires, you know, an ability to stay calm, an ability to stay focused. You know, it requires a commercial um, sensibility uh, and realistic uh, prospects on what's available. You know, I mean, we have we have situations. I have one situation that I'm involved in where uh, one of the investors is looking for, uh, you know, government assistance, right, and is making asks of the government um, or wants to make asks of the government, right, that are not commercial. And I don't think I don't think we should be doing that. I don't think the government is going to provide assistance in an uncommercial way. Uh, I think we have to think through carefully what we're asking. We have to be thoughtful what we're asking. We have to recognize the government is receiving. The government is receiving um, questions and uh, support, questions for support or requests for support from all different types of organizations, big and small. Uh, and it's incumbent, I think, on uh, all of us uh, to recognize that this is a much bigger issue than whatever may be facing our company uh, and structure um, what our asks are uh, and what positions we're going to take, you know, within the capital structure and at the board level with that in mind. Great. Alan, I think you have the final word. Okay. Well, let me just pick up on something that Mark said and, and emphasize it. Uh, clearly, uh, clearly the, the, uh, uh, the market and companies, look to boards for leadership. And, and this is one of those times that I think it's important to be not just leading, but seen to be leading. And I think Mark said it well, that people are looking to us as directors to be the calm uh, eye in the center of the storm, uh, objective, supportive, uh, but with leadership around a plan once a plan comes together and an ability to support management as they struggle with things that are changing daily. So I, I think this is a, a really good opportunity for great directors to become even greater and good directors to become better leaders in the organization. And by implication, leading in the organization will lead with the, uh, with the staff and it will lead uh, with the, the general environment, uh, including, including government. I, I, I want to reemphasize the point. Another point that Mark made is this is uh, this is drawing all sorts of requests out to government that cannot be met. And so, if you're a board of directors and you think that that this is going to be something where you'll be able to get a real advantage by going to to government, you're not going to. The best you can hope for is a level playing field. Some great comments there. Thank you very much to both of you, and thank you all for listening to this webinar. Look out for new installments of this series every week as we navigate this challenge together. Keep well.